help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Hey, welcome back to the Ancient Christian Writers series, and we're currently reading St. John Cassian's conferences, and we're picking up with our reading of the 19th conference on Cenobites and Hermits. So Cassian, through uh, the elder, has been guiding us through the differences between the two forms of life, the more common life where uh, monks would live under an, an abbot and they would have a common work together that they would be able to sustain themselves, uh, they would pray in common more frequently, and then uh, of course the hermits who would live a more solitary life still have uh, an elder that would guide them, but typically would live uh, a life of deeper solitude. And so what we'll be looking at here this evening is the end of each of those lives as the Abba puts it before them this evening, and then some of the particular challenges that uh, the hermit will, will face, uh, living alone in the deeper solitude of the desert. Uh, what does one do when overcome with passions again? How is it you struggle when you're on your own and don't have an elder to watch over you and, and guide and direct you? How's you? How is it that you enter into the battle at that point? And so these are some of the things that we'll look at, and as always, we'll try to apply it to our day-to-day day-to-day life. We're picking up on page 674, section 7, where Germanus is, uh, or I'm sorry, Cassian's traveling companion, Germanus, uh, puts uh, another question uh, to Abba John. Since it is clear that you have not, like so many people, been merely a beginner in both professions, but has scaled their very heights, we want to know what the end of the Cenobite is and what the end of the Hermit is. For there is no doubt that nobody can discuss this more confidently and more fully than a person who has pursued both perfections over a long period, with experience as his teacher. He can make known their value and end by a trustworthy teaching. So if you remember, Abba John was sort of a rare breed of monk that he had spent many years in the Cenobium and then had made the decision to uh, enter into greater sol- solitude, so became an anchorite, had lived that for a long period of time, and then began to struggle with certain passions, certain difficulties in, in the deep solitude, and so returns to the synobium where he felt that he could live that more perfectly, even though he might not be able to attain uh, the greater heights of contemplation that the anchorite could, that there in the Snobium, he would find the safer, safer path. But he, so he becomes a, a unique teacher in regards to, he's, he's one who's lived both lives very well and knows the challenges of each. Abba John responds, I would be able to say in unqualified fashion that one and the same person could not be perfect in both professions. Did not the example of a very few prevent me? Since it is a great thing to find someone who is accomplished in one of them, it is obvious that it is all the more difficult, and I would almost say impossible, for a person to be fully perfect in both. Yet if this happens sometimes, it cannot all at once be generalized about. For a universal rule should not be made based upon a small minority, that is, with reference to a few people, but upon what is available to the many, and indeed to everyone. But the things are attained to very rarely and by very few people that go beyond the possibilities of ordinary virtue and are conceded to be, as it were, above the condition of human weakness and above nature, should not be mentioned along with general precepts, and they should, not be, and they should be put forward not as examples but as marvels. Hence I shall speak briefly of what you are asking about as much as my mediocre intelligence permits. So he does know a few who were able to live this life uh, to its perfection, both lives to its perfection. But the, the point here that he makes, I think, is important, that these aren't the examples that we are to look to, that we're more interested in the ordinary sort of uh, search for, for virtue. If we're too focused upon these extraordinary figures, we aren't going to apply ourselves to what is more necessary to the spiritual life. Do you need a book to follow along? You sure? Okay. The end of the Cenobite is to put to death 
and to crucify all his desires, and in accordance with the saving command of the gospel perfection, to have no thought for the next day. It is very certain that this perfection cannot be arrived at by anyone but a Cenobite. The prophet Isaiah describes this man and blesses and praises him as follows. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your own will on my holy day, and if you glorify him while not following your own ways, and if your own will to speak a word is not found, then you shall delight over the Lord, and I will lift you up above the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the inheritance of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So the Cenobite lives the common life, and he's able to live that uh, gospel perfection of not worrying about tomorrow, that the common life provides the benefit of <clears throat> everybody working together in order to provide a certain amount of food every day, the labor split. And so the Cenobite can go about his pursuit of the monastic perfection. He can live in obedience to his elders, go about his work, have a deep prayer life, and yet not be anxious about tomorrow. Whereas we discussed last time, sometimes the anchorite can become actually overly, overly fixated on how he's going to provide for himself since he lacks the support of a community. Now, if you're living alone, all of a sudden you have to be thinking about what you're going to eat tomorrow. And some of, for some of them, that came to absorb a lot of their energy, where they began to try to provide you know, enough for a year's food and extra clothing for themselves and blankets and things such as that. And so they were actually being pulled away from the life of contemplation because they became overly fixated upon earthly concerns. And so there's a kind of detachment that the Cenobite can live. And I think when we look at our own lives, that's true. And even here at the oratory, we're relatively small, but the fact that there are a good number of us, we can sort of split the labors, the duties in terms of the care of the house. And, um, and so we can go about our labors with a kind of freedom without uh, having to worry too much about, about tomorrow. And that we also have those who support us so that we can focus on that work too. And living in seclusion certainly w wouldn't allow that. But the perfection of the hermit is to have a mind bare of all earthly things and as much as human frailty permits, to unite it thus with Christ. The prophet Jeremiah describes this man and says, Blessed is the man who has borne the yoke from his youth. He shall sit solitary and be still, because he has taken it upon himself. The psalmist also, I have become like a pelican in the desert. I watched and I became like a sparrow alone on the roof. So the end of the hermit is to have his mind bare of all things. He reaches this level of theoria or contemplation that undistracted by conversations with others, he's able to still the mind and the heart uh, to such an extent that he's able to maintain a, an undistracted prayer throughout the course of the day. And so live in a more constant state of union and communion with God. And what we're going to go on to see is that how important it is to have uh, reached the level of detachment that the Cenobite re reaches, the freedom from the passions, in order that when one look, enters into the, the silence of the desert, that you're free from those things and aren't pulled away from your ultimate end, which would be contemplation. If you're spending all of your time struggling with certain thoughts, images, ideas, or attachment to material goods, you're not going to be able to attain to that end. Unless each of them arrives at the end, therefore, which we have said belongs to his own profession, in vain does the one pursue the discipline of the synobium and the other that of the anchorite life, for neither has practiced the virtue of his own profession. Okay. Any thoughts so far in this little bit of introductory material? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just one thing, uh, kind of reading through it, it's kind of it's kind of difficult putting uh, just for example uh, for me um, 
like it's kind of tough seeing myself in either category. Uh, like, uh, say, um, like I'll be getting married this summer, and God willing, we have kids. Like that, like we're always going to have that kind of um, pull to think about the future and kind of plan for like their well-being and ours. And um, is there um, like? <clears throat> to what extent should we still kind of uh, try to attain that uh, cenobitic uh, lifestyle, or is there something else that we should? Yeah, we we touched upon this briefly last time, but uh, we discussed the 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 family as being the domestic church, and if you remember earlier on in the text, uh, Cassian uh, ties the cenobitic life to the, the life of the apostles, you know, those who lived in common and shared common goods together. And last time we, we talked a little bit about the, the family as perhaps being modeled then on, on the Cenobitic life, a form of it, that you, you know, live a kind of common life with wife, children, that, and if that is embraced with a kind of simplicity uh, so you will ultimately have to provide for the needs of your family, children, uh, all of their needs, emotional, spiritual, and physical. And yet there can be a way where that is embraced with a kind of simplicity that it does allow a focus upon God, the pursuit of the life of virtue, the pursuit of life of prayer, that family life can become very much ordered to God, common devotions, you know, educating the children in the faith. We're, we are so used now, used to in our culture, uh, living a life of distraction or living for entertainment. So working hard in order to provide as many opportunities for ourselves and our children as we can. And so even the Catholic family life has become very secular. We walk in a kind of lockstep with the culture around us. Uh, so much so that a Catholic or family wouldn't be necessarily identifiable or distinguishable from uh, a, a purely secular family, that all, all the same ends seem to be pursued. Whereas one would say, in looking at the gospel and looking at the writings of the saints, we would seek to foster a kind of simplicity, whatever life that we would pursue, that would allow us to have God really at the center of our lives. So that relationship with God would form and shape everything that we do, your work, education of your children, raising them, your relationship with your wife, that certain distractions would be set aside in order to pursue those fundamental vocations more fully. So your common vocation with all Christians, which is the universal call to holiness, and then your particular vocation of marriage, that you would live that in as holy a fashion as you could, as well as pre potential and future father. And I think we know, looking around at so many families, that they've been pulled apart often because they've lacked that simplicity or clarity of a focus, that so many other things take center stage. And gradually, the, the life of faith uh, is pushed out to the margins to the point that it can no longer be really formative. And so if I were to say, or if you, if you were to ask, where do I see myself in this? I would say it would be more the cenobitic life, that you and your wife would work together as spiritual partners in order to strengthen each other in the pursuit of that life of holiness and that you would be a kind of spiritual father as well as biological father to your children, you know, educating them in the ways of, of faith, goodness, truth, virtue. But that's not an easy thing to do. You almost have to have that so radically clear in your mind that you can pursue it in a very definite fashion because the world ar around you isn't going to look at life in that way. Yeah, it, like, just, 
just thinking of, and I know you've talked about this a lot, but just thinking of like the television, like like that in itself almost clouds that vision of simplicity because it's like you come home from work and you kind of just uh, uh, vegetate. <laughs> I think you phrased that word uh, on that, mm -hmm. and like that in itself kind of cuts out that spirituality. Right. But, uh, yeah, I think it's last such a radical thought. Yeah, it seems like a radical thought, but it, yeah. I think it, for us as Christians, it should be a, a sort of a, the normal, natural way that we would look at things, that we would want to provide an, event, uh, uh, an environment for our family where a certain kind of life would be fostered, that we would not lose ourselves in you know, the distractions and the entertainments uh, of the world. That there, I think last time we even talked a little bit about how in monasteries they will have a period like grand silence, where after a certain time there's silence, complete silence in the monastery in order to allow for a kind of reflectivity. That, uh, you know, it, and certainly in the family, something like that could be established. You know, there doesn't need, one doesn't have to have the television on, you know, or have. You know, children sitting in front of their computer or iPad or whatever it is until they go to go to sleep. There can be common prayers and devotions that are said, as well as a common meal. You know, to break bread with each other is you know allows a kind of intimacy uh, to develop. Then that would really spill over. Then I think also into our celebration of the Holy Eucharist that we gather daily to break bread with each other and we do that sort of in a prayerful recollected fashion and so the the dining room becomes an extension of the chapel or the church and that's what's supposed to be in a religious community that there's a connection between the refectory and the chapel and so the the silence and the prayerfulness that one finds in the chapel extends to the dining area and the meal taken together is taken in a prayerful way, you know, acknowledging the, the, the goodness of God for providing the food for us, but uh, that it would be taken in a recollected way, rather than, you know, maybe nobody being there <laughs> because, you know, running out to music lessons or soccer practice or having the television turned on. And so there being no communion there, what people are communing with is the that virtual reality on the tube. The problem is, is we don't allow ourselves enough time really to think about that. And even college, you think about it, it should be a formative period where we're forming ourselves not just intellectually, but as human beings. And, you know, anymore it becomes job training. You know, and that's what you're preparing yourself for. And uh, but the formation of the person and how how we look at life and relationships is often sacrificed for that purpose. And you know, some universities actually live you know a kind of inhumane life. You know, the, how they push their students and glory in that. You know, we'll give them so much work that they are sleeping four hours a night and they have no time for anything else. So. But an important question, I think, you know, where, where do we fit, where do we fit in into this? Does this really have anything to say to us? And I think we would say yes, it has radical things to say to us. And not just because they are, you know, very holy men living in the desert, but because it's really a reflection of the, the lived gospel. What we see in them is individuals seeking to live the gospel in, in its most radical form. Any other comments? My, my niece's husband insists that they have eight children, that they say the rosary when they're in the car. Right. That's a great example. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So to have things that are formative of a, of a clear identity as a, as a Christian family. This is kind of a minor note, I guess, but like, can you, like, how early can you start that, though? 
Well, immediately, I think it begins first with. First word is in Jesus. You I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it begins immediately with the couple. You know, it's yeah. you know the embrace of the sacramental life, the sacramental bond that your relationship with each other becomes a reflection of Christ's relationship with His bride, the Church, and so you live those vows out as fully as possible and that you seek to support each other in that pursuit of holiness and begin to build a culture even you know, amongst the two of you and then among the two of you. I don't know why I said amongst. <laughs> <laughs> among the two of you. And so you build out from there you know, as each child comes and they're born into that culture. And you know, very quickly then we baptize them and then they are brought into the culture of the larger church that is to be formative, too. So immediately, I think, would be in the same, same way that we do everything else. You know, we look at how young people expose their children to, to things that they feel are good for them, whether it's the you know, pursuit of music or athletics. You know, they'll start them out at these absurd ages and and you know some of the Olympians, you hear of them like sending their kids away at age, you know, eight or nine to live with some great coach in another country. You think what? You know, it would be like one of us saying, "Well, I'm going to send my son off to a monastery," you know, in order to, <laughs> that he might learn the ways of, you know, of the Christian life. And so, you know, in every other field, we will pursue with our whole heart, and yet for some reason, in, in terms of Christianity and the formation of the faith, there's a kind of negligence there. It becomes an afterthought, you know, something that comes in to play after we've done everything else that we have to. So, okay. yes. Unfortunately, we didn't do this, but I guess, you know, if you're praying the rosary and the baby's there, you know, in the infant seed, and then curling and playing while you're praying the rosary, then the baby will just grow up knowing that. And that's just an example, but the baby would know no different. So you wouldn't be pulling and dragging when he's five because he's, he's a, or older because he's been used to a culture of prayer in the home, and it's right. just the way it is. Even yeah. if he doesn't partake in it yeah. at first, you know, but then. Yeah, if we <coughs> look at, you know, Cassian's larger premise of. You know, pursuing purity of heart, that you know, children see the world through their parents' eyes, and so if the father and mother are pure of heart, you know that they're living the life fully. You know, just by example, the the children are going to you know, see that. You know how they approach their work, how they engage each other, how they talk to each other, the language that they use. You know, you think of. The image that would be emblazoned upon a son's, you know, mind or imagination, seeing, you know, the father kneeling at the foot of his bed praying. And how many, how many children see that today? And among the Eastern Christians, Catholic and Orthodox, you know, there are all the dietary things too. You know, in regards to the fasting periods, you know that. Very quickly, children pick up that the, ca the Catholic life is something different. We approach life in a different way, how we eat, you know, even. But there are holy periods of time where we deepen our spiritual disciplines. You know, Father, my kids are grown now, but when we go out to dinner, we still say grace eat at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Make the sign across. I still get nervous when when I'm ready to do it. If you're like a you know this exquisite restaurant and people are sitting there and I shouldn't, and I can sort of feel the tension with the family. Like we're gonna do this. Like you have to like be a brave soldier and to say yeah we'll continue this no matter what age your children are. I mean we've done it since they were little, and then you don't feel like okay they're 
teenagers now will stop. Well, now they're getting into their 20s if we're all out and we're going to stop. So you just have to keep, you know, you know what's right. It's just like secular society will try to tell you that it's not right. Well, that's it. I mean, we live in a post-Christian age. It's a secular culture. And this whole idea of walking in step with the culture around us, that we're going to be more and more hesitant, you know, feeling that we're going to be scrutinized, not, you know, even for our beliefs, but for something as simple as making the, the sign of the cross. And maybe it's not as simple as I make it out to be. I mean, the cross is always the most provocative thing of our Christian faith. And so to make it in public is to say something about ourselves, but it, it's also to bear witness to, uh, you know, a greater truth. And so, yeah, there has to be a kind of boldness and consistency in doing that. Okay, we're moving on. <laughs> okay, section nine. But this perfection that is not integral and complete in all respects is only a part of perfection. Perfection is rare, then, and is conceded to very few by God's gift. For a person is truly and not partially perfect when he endures both the bleakness of solitude in the desert and the weakness of his brothers in the cenobium with equal greatness of soul. Consequently, it is difficult to find someone who is completely accomplished in both professions because the anchorite cannot wholly attain uh, to the contempt and privation of material things, nor can the Cenobite wholly attain to the purity of Theoria. So they both take, you know, an extraordinary discipline. You know, for those living the common life, you really have to watch what's going on within the heart because you can find your brothers to be irritating, or if it's in a family, you know, you can find your wife or husband irritating, and so you have to take that thought captive, be guard, you know, guard your heart and struggle with those passions. Whereas if you're living on your own as an anchorite, then you have to struggle in a more solitary way to maintain the, that, the purpose of, of embracing that life, which is, is the solitude that allows for contemplation. That, you know, we can, you know, a person who embraces that life could slip back into just distractions, laziness, you know, sleeping away hours rather than uh, using that freedom to engage in deeper prayer. And so there was one pope, I don't know if it was John Paul II, who talked about those who live like the consecrated single life, the freedom that goes along with that. It's not the freedom simply to do whatever you want. So, whoo, I'm a bachelor, and so I can just watch, you know, football all weekend long because I'm, I'm unattached and, you know, I can do that. The, the freedom is to, you know, live in greater charity, to serve others, and also the freedom to live a deeper life of prayer. And so if one is called to that life, there, again, there has to be a kind of clarity about that, that it's not self-absorption, that the focus is on God and others. And one would almost look at that as like the life of an anchorite. I'm sorry, where did I leave off? Nonetheless. Nonetheless, we know that Abba Moses and Abba Pafnutius <coughs> and two Makari possessed both perfectly, and thus they were perfect in both professions. They went off further than all other dwellers of the desert and were nourished insatiably in the recesses of the desert. Never as much as in them lay, as in them lay, did they seek human companionship. Yet they so put up with the throng of those who sought them out and with their weaknesses that although an innumerable multitude of brothers came to see them for the sake of their own profit, they endured with a steady patience the almost constant annoyance of welcoming them, and they gave the impression of having taught and practiced nothing else their whole life through their whole life through than the showing of kindness to visitors, such that no one was sure which profession of theirs they gave more of an effort to, 
that is, whether their greatness of soul was more wonderfully fit for air medical purity or for the communal way of life. So you can see why it would be difficult that, that you know, living this life of deep solitude and yet trying to show hospitality to those who would be seeking your counsel wouldn't be an easy thing to do. If you went out, you know, seeking the most secluded place, then to have people hunt you down and still be, you know, sort of charitable You've about tried. that. Okay. Leave me alone. <laughs> okay. Now this is sort of the interesting part because he begins to sort of unpack for us what's going on within the mind and in the heart of an anchorite when he, he might be struggling with something like that. But some people become so savage due to the unbroken silence of the desert that they are utterly distraught at the society of human beings. And when they depart even a little from the habits of their reclusion because of the visit of some brothers, they are shaken by a remarkable mental anguish and by manifest indications of faint-heartedness. This is usually the case in particular with those who have not been instructed perfectly in the Cenobia and have not purified themselves of their former vices, but have betaken themselves to the solitary life out of an immature desire. These people, always imperfect and weak in any event, are moved wherever the wind of disturbance blows. Just as they are shaken with impatience at the society of the brothers or at an interruption from them, so also, when they are living in the desert, they cannot bear the vastness of that very silence that they have sought out. For in fact, they do not even know the reason why the desert should be desired or sought out. Rather, they consider this alone to be virtuous and the height of their profession, that they reject the society of brothers and flee from and detest the sight of human beings. So you could see they could end up on the edge of madness, but also of great sin. You know, they can almost revert to a more animalistic kind of stage, sa sa become savages, that, you know, they enter into that solitude, not so much seeking God, but there's a romantic or an idealistic view of the aeromedical life. So they haven't been free <coughs> from the passions. They haven't attained that level of purity of heart. And so when they get out into the desert, you know, the anger, for example, that they might uh, have directed towards others in community and would have to deal with more directly uh, by being corrected by an elder, that anger that has no object could be then redirected back at themselves or directed at inanimate objects even. And so there could be a kind of insanity that would overcome them. So the anchoritic life is not meant for everyone, in fact, very few. And we begin to see why the, the purity of heart is emphasized so early in Cassian's conferences. How could you pursue the higher things unless your heart has been purified from the vices? And the most obvious example of that lack of purity then would be how much anger that they would show at somebody uh, coming to see them for counsel, that if their hearts had really been formed and formed by that silence, even in a deeper way, like if they were living in this deep communion with God, then when visitors would show up, that immediately they would respond with a kind of hospitality as if they were receiving Christ himself, that there would be no difference for them at that point between the solitude and the silence and the serving of those who are coming to them. Everything would be love for them at this point. So the father feeds tight, that had these issues. They had a passion when they went in, some out of love for Christ and a fellow man, and then others went in with a passion, maybe of hatred to begin with, like something, not hatred for Christ, but issues, obviously, and escaping. <laughs> Issues. Issues. That's such a generic term, I know. Like, right. Just, yeah, it, it they, was misdirected, whatever their passions were, were misdirected. Yeah, that they were more interested in the, in the secluded life for itself rather than seeing it as an end. That they were recluses in the sense that they just didn't like being around others. Period. Period. And, 
you know, so entering into the desert than if somebody would approach them. It's, so there was a movie that came out not too long ago. What the heck was that called? Uh, Robert Duvall, you know, the one I was talking about. He plays the crazy hermit. Get, get Low is called. Oh, yeah. It's fairly recent, but uh, he commits a sin as a younger man and imposes his own kind of punishment on himself, his own penance, and and lives for like 40 or 50 years, I can't remember which it is, uh, as a hermit. And, you know, puts up signs, you know, keep away, <laughs> keep the hell away, you know, he keeps adding to it and scares kids off with shotguns and things like that. And so anyone who would come up, you know, to try to sell him something, you know, they would drive up and ignore the sign, he would shoot at, shoot at them and <laughs> things such as that. And so this would be sort of the image that we would have in mind, you know, that one who just doesn't want to be in the company of others for one reason or another, terrible guilt, maybe over something like that, or maybe some deeper psychological issue. And that's, again, that's why living the common life would be so important, because those things would be revealed over time. That as we live in community with each other, you know, the deeper parts of our personality and char characteristics, char character begin to emerge. And it's in their emergence and our struggling with those things that they can be purified by the grace of God. We have to struggle and we're humbled by our own faults and weaknesses. Same thing in marriages, that the longer you're married, you know, you begin to see each other's faults and flaws, and you know, sometimes it can be a very humiliating thing, you know, when you see those things emerge for the thousandth time, <laughs> you, you know, say or react to a situation in a particular way, or when you have to deal with patients with the other who does that same thing for the thousandth time too. And, but there is a fruit that's, that comes out of that, you know, a perfecting of patience, of, of love, of long suffering. And if you don't have that going into the desert, you're, you're in trouble. One more thing. What about discernment for religious life, you know, and the, the desert being for some, going into religious life, right? Mm -hmm. And going for the wrong reasons. You know, this is horrible to say, but what popped into my mind were the mean nuns in school and how they probably should not have gone into religious life. Like, they're just so, so many of them are just so mean to everyone. No, and I'm just, no, not everyone. I have <laughs> stories, and I've heard stories. But <laughs> I tell my sister, you know, every morning start with a beating, no matter what. And you, set the, you, set the, you set the tone for the kids. About <laughs> the discernment and going into religious yeah. life and jumping. Okay, you're talking about the desert, but I'm right. talking about jumping straight into religious life for the wrong. Sure, reason. and the same thing could be said of marriage too. Marriage. That you know that we can enter into either of those vocations without. Uh, a kind of the formation, the kind of formation that we would need emotionally, spirit and spiritually. There can be an emotional immaturity that breaks down the freedom to enter into that commitment fully, or that allows one to enter into that relationship fully. And so, if somebody is going off into religious life as a teenage girl, you know, spiritually she might have a genuine desire there, but emotionally she might not be capable of dealing with the rigors of the spiritual life and the asceticism. And unless there was someone there that was really good at formation to help bring them along in those particular struggles, you know, sometimes those communities, we have to remember, some of them grew at this incredibly fast rate. And you'd have all these young women come in, coming in right out of high school. And the personal kind of attention that one would need to live that life well often wasn't given. And so what we found is this really regimented kind of life. Did I ever tell you that story where there was one novice mistress uh, that when they wanted every, she wanted everybody to be on the same level 
and like for pictures and stuff like that. And so they made these like base, so the different heights. So when they were all standing on it, they were all on the same level. So there were these kind of absurd practices that were meant, I think, to diminish the individuality. And that would only further harm the emotional development of some coming into these communities at a very young age. And so, and then they're thrust into these ministry situations where they're put, they're made t teachers at age 18 of a class of what, 50 or something. I don't know how big the classes were back, say in the 50s or 60s, but from what I gather, they were pretty large. And so you think, okay, this is a young girl just fresh out of high school, just left, never been away from home, now responsible for 50 kids. Well, if that were me, I'd be whacking them all over. <laughs> you know, it's just like, how, how, you know, the thought, the thought is, you know, how do I control this group of kids in order to guide and direct them? And they're just not going to have the maturity or the experience to do that. That's, and sometimes they were learning the lesson one step ahead of their students and then trying to teach that. And they wouldn't have all been natural teachers. So I'm not saying all this is an, as an excuse, but I'm saying boy, they were really, they might have been spiritually advanced in the sense of their desire for God, but emotionally they were little children themselves expected to live you know, this very disciplined life. And you know, the same can be true of marriage. You know, people entering into it, they may be entering into it. It's funny, my parents married very, very young, well, fairly young. My, you know, my dad had finished college, but my mom was like 18, 19. But they were, there was a maturity at that age. You know, my mom was the youngest of eight, and there was this sense of what it took to really run a household, and she did the ironing for the whole house and all of her brothers and stuff like that, help with cooking. And so the idea of running a home, you know, was something that one could enter into. And sometimes the older siblings even acted as parental figures, you know, for the younger ones. And so they, they were pushed into a kind of maturity, even starting work at younger ages, they were pushed into a kind of maturity so that they could enter into that, into marriage, and persevere in it. You know, we have people getting married later now, you know, sometimes in their late 30s even, you know, and, and not necessarily more mature, spiritually or emotionally. You know, you take a guy who comes home from work and is playing video games every night, or going out to the pub or watching football with his buddies, isn't necessarily going to prepare him to enter into marriage or to be a father raising children. So, you know, just like those sisters, there needs to be a kind of emotional and spiritual formation that prepares someone to make that level of commitment. And the same thing happens in a marriage. It then becomes chaotic, just like the classroom in, right. in every vocation. It right. just doesn't revolve correctly. Right. And there's not the extended family. Like in the past, too, there would be a large extended family where you would have o older married couples offering guidance and counsel to a cu couple, young couple that would be struggling. And now everybody's scattered all over, living in isolation, and often fe feeling very alone, having to do things on their own. So it's a terrible strain, emotionally and spiritually. So you begin to see how important all this is in terms of our formation as human beings and the, the crosses and trials that we would face. Yes? How was it that the Cenobites kind of gave themselves over to the fact that they would never reach the highest perfection when it sounds like they may have without maybe even knowing it? Well, More it's, so than the hermits. it's not that they would give themselves over with thinking that they would never be called to that. I think there was a clear understanding, though, that where one is formed in the spiritual life is the synobium. And so people would enter into that, not assuming, though, that they would be called on to the anchoritic life. It would be only the very few who would do that. 
And that's, I think, what Cassian is trying to say. It's those who, who assume that they are called to that and in pride pursue it prematurely that run into grave problems. And the same, again, can be true for marriage. You know, to think you're prepared, but really not have done what is necessary to enter into that kind of relationship. Okay. Where are we now again? Eleven. Eleven. Germanus. What remedy, then, will be able to be of service to us or to others who have the same weakness and the same limitations? We who have barely been instructed in cenobitic discipline and before having rid ourselves of all of our vices have begun to take up living in the desert. Or how shall we be able to acquire a constant and undistracted mind and an unchanging and firm patience? We who have given up the community of the Cenobium at an inopportune moment and have abandoned, as it were, the school and training ground of this practice in which our beginnings ought to have been fully developed and perfected. How then, now that we are living in solitude, shall we pursue the perfection of long-suffering and patience? Or how will our conscience, which searches into interior movements, understood the ver understand the virtues that it has and those that are lacking to it, when we may be deceived in our judgment and believe that we possess a firmly tranquil mind since we are not aroused by annoyances from people when we are removed from their society. So Germanus is picking up on the fact that he and Cassian did make a rash judgment in uh, thinking that they could come to the deserts of Egypt, learn things very quickly, and go back and teach their fellow monks. And not only that, that they had moved into uh, a more solitary life way too early, that they had only been in the Cenobium for a couple of years before coming to Egypt. And so at this point, you think, in the conferences, they must be humiliated because they're walking around asking all of these you know, men who have you know, really been trained you know, for years in the Cenobium these two young bucks are, you know, wandering around the desert. And, uh, you know, with good hearts, certainly, and seeking holiness genuinely. But at this point, it must have been very humbling for them. So Abba John responds, In truth, curative remedies cannot be lacking to those who look for healing from that most true physician of souls. So Christ, the divine physician, will, will never abandon someone, that even though they may have chosen this path prematurely, if they are faithful and seek out help from Christ, he's not going to leave them, leave them abandoned to, the, you know, to their illness. This is especially the case with respect to those who do not disregard their ill health out of despair or negligence, or hide their dangerous wounds, or reject the medication of repentance with an impudent mind but once having gotten sick through ignorance or error or necessity, have recourse with humble yet cautious mind to the heavenly physician. Consequently, we should know that if we go off to the desert or to remote places with our vices not yet attended to, only their effects will be repressed, but the dispositions to them will not be extinguished. And so they'll receive the help of the divine physician if they are humble and if they're, they have this capacity to acknowledge their sickness when they see it. Uh, but the, the problem is, is that once having you know, had this pride that leaves them, leads them prematurely into the desert, then they're not likely going to be able to see that. And not having uprooted those vices, uh, you know, how are they going to find a, a curative remedy if you can't ask? for it, or you don't even have a spirit of repentance to seek God's mercy and help. For there lies concealed within us, indeed there creeps about within us, the unplucked root of all our sins, which we see is still alive in us from the following indi indications. For example, when we live in the desert and react to the arrival of the brothers 
or a very brief delay of theirs with an anxious and upset mind, then we know that the stuff of impatience is still very much alive in us. But when we are looking forward to the arrival of a brother, and he has perchance been delayed a short while out of some necessity, if even an unspoken mental anger blames him for his delay, and if concern over our protracted waiting disturbs our mind, then an examination of our conscience will show that the vices of anger and annoyance manifestly remain in us. I put yikes next to this <laughs> because you know, the idea you know, that this is a pretty great thing, that someone is delayed and you even have you know, a momentary you know, feeling or thought of anger, you know that the, the vice is still deeply embedded there. And, you know, th th I always find the Desert Fathers' writings, you know, jarring and eye-opening for this reason, because they know the human heart and how the mind works so well that we can hide a lot of things from ourselves, and we can avoid even avoid the company of others. And so, you know, begin to s perhaps see ourselves as being more virtuous than we really are. And yet, some little thing can set us off. Somebody's late, mm -hmm. you know, for an appointment or something like that, and you begin to stew over it, or, you know, or somebody just says something off color that doesn't strike us right, and we can be moved to, you know, bitterness that stays with us for even a couple of days. And so we begin to see what's real, really going on in our heart and how, how lacking we are in that purity. But we have to think, how aware are we of these things? Do we do the kind of examination of conscience regularly that allows us to begin to see with a greater and greater clarity those subtle movements of the mind and heart? That's why the practice of making a daily, exam uh, daily examination of conscience is so important, that it heightens the sensitivity of the conscience. And it will rebuke us for, for those subtle infractions that perhaps we wouldn't even see at another time. The more formed it becomes, the more sensitive it becomes to these things. And so we begin to be more refined in uprooting these passions. We can almost be completely oblivious to them as we are all, often almost completely oblivious to the pre presence of God in our day-to-day -day life. And again, I think this draws us back to the whole idea of simplicity. You know, having that space within our lives that we can really listen to God and be attentive to His presence, not crowding out the silence in our life. And this goes for our liturgy as well. I just uh, read a little interview from Cardinal Sarah from Africa where he's talking about the importance of silence within the liturgy, that we really allow God to speak to us and that we have to foster and protect that silence not only for ourselves but for everyone else too, that we have to prepare ourselves to enter into that experience so that in a kind of narcissistic way we don't, you know, just get caught up in the noise of our own mind and, you know, begin celebrating something where we aren't discerning the, the deeper reality of what's taking place there. You know, we often lose sight of the fact, again, that we are at the foot of Calvary. You know, that we're participating in the sacrifice of Christ. And there has to be a kind of solemnity that we would bring to that. Not, you know, a you know, morbid kind of sadness, but, you know, this sense of where we are and what we are participating in and the immensity of the love and the sacrifice that is being made on our behalf. How do we enter into the celebration of the Eucharist, take it seriously and allow it to call us to conversion if there's complete distraction and chaos in our, in our hearts or perhaps chaos within the community. 
you know, he talks about applauding and clapping and things like that. And it's like completely out of place. I mean, if you're at the foot of the cross and you're engaged in that reality, that's not going to be your mental attitude. And so there's a formation of mind and heart that has to take place that, allow, that allows for that. And so the same thing for the formation of conscience. You know, we have to have that silence enough in our lives that we have the capacity to see what's going on within. I think that's why we seek out distraction so much too. You know, so we don't have to see those things because they can be so humbling. I think it's why we end up surrendering to distraction mm -hmm. because I mean, this is when you're, when you're just trying to start the most simple discipline in your own life to mm -hmm. create the space for a prayer. Right. It's going to cause stress. Because um, you should be, there probably are a million things that are going to come to you and say, you should be doing right. that. <laughs> and, and to maintain mm -hmm. that and say, no, this is, this is what I am made for right. first. Yeah. And it's, it's, it seems so obvious when I, when I say it out loud. But it does, it, that's right, when we say it out loud, it seems so obvious that this, the silence would allow for this radical intimacy with God, and if that's the norm for us, then we are going to find it joyful, and one would think we would even begin to gravitate towards that more in order that we might experience it. But can it be experienced as absolute hell, you know, if there is a kind of radical, radical you know, distraction or disorder within our hearts, you know, that we experience wounds from our sin, from our life in general that make it very difficult for us to be in that silence. There's a little chapel out at St. Vincent's, uh, Arch Abbey. Have you ever been down in the Basilica? There's a Marian. Have you been in that one? You're out at St. Vincent a lot. The silence is intense there. You can almost hear, you know, your heartbeat. It's that kind of silence. And, and uh, I read an article also once recently, too, that they constructed this room in such a way that the, the silence is so intense that people can't stay in that room for more than like like 30 seconds or something like that. It was just, I was really shocked because you can begin to hear your blood you know, pulse through your veins in it. There's such a deep silence. And I think that's how we often will experience the silence of prayer. Or if you go into adoration in the chapel, that you know, we can find it agitating and sometimes even painful at first. And I think that's where kind of faith comes in to allow yourself to experience the discomfort of that and remain in it. You know, allow Christ to call you as deeply into it as he desires and trust that he'll allow you to stay there. It's interesting, I never thought of till that exchange right there that they like, so often in adoration there's like a thousand and one things that I'm like, I'm planning and I'm trying to figure out in my head. And I'm like, well, I shouldn't, you know, like this isn't the right place for this. But these are things that I'm like worrying about or trying to figure out or planning or putting together. And it never occurred to me until now that like when it's Downton Abbey night, I don't think about all of these things the whole time I'm watching it. I'm like, wow, I just I wish I could just watch my favorite show. Like, I never have that problem. I only have that problem when I'm in adoration. I, like, we're, we don't get distracted from entertainment. Right. Well, because, as we've so often said, it's a, a, a virtual reality, a virtual contemplation that doesn't create that level of discomfort because we're entering into the life, the imaginary world of another so that we don't have to deal with the real world within ourselves. And so often when we go into prayer, we'll get sleepy, you know, and as soon as we get up, you know, we're energized and out and about doing things. Or, you know, we'll get distract distracted, as you said, start going through, you know, our daily schedule, things we have to get at the grocery store. And so there is a real discipline of remaining in that silence, and in particular in adoration, too, because of the intensity of that encounter, you know, that the Eucharist is exposed for us to gaze upon. 
So we're, we're drawn into that intimacy in and th- through uh, the physical gaze of our eyes. We are able to gaze upon the Eucharistic face of Christ. And so there's an intensity of that focus. And if we enter into that, it can be a very powerful and beautiful experience. But it can be also something that is difficult for us to allow ourselves to do, that we will distract ourselves with reading or even some other kind of devotion rather than simply allowing ourselves to look upon Christ and remain there conscious of his presence and directing our love towards him. You can enter into, you know, we're, I think with the Daughters of St. Philip Neri, we were reading about being Buddhist at, uh, adores. You know, we enter into adoration, uh, not seeking this conscious experience of the presence of Christ, but even seeking sort of like a mindless thoughtlessness. Or So we can either distract ourselves by reading a spiritual book be like reading a book in the presence of Christ, or like Martha focusing upon, you know, the, the externals, being anxious about a lot of things, instead of just sitting there listening to Christ. So we'll be, you know, reading a book rather than looking upon him. Or we can s- slip into this Buddhist kind of adoration where we numb our minds. That's not what we're called to. You know, it's the, the silence that we're called to is always a very personal and it's, in fact, extremely personal experience. You know, it's not to free the mind, you know, of everything in order that we don't experience pain. You know, in fact, for the Christian, you know, we free the mind from distractions and thoughts, but we're moving from the multiplicity to the simplicity upon Christ. And the more that we enter in and through that simplicity into that intimacy with him, the greater the suffering that we're going to experience because we're going to enter into the the mystery of the cross with him. We're going to experience something of that self-emptying love of the cross that empties itself. And that's why adoration is the greatest form of reparation because we are being attentive to Christ in that moment of self-sacrifice in the most intense way. We're consoling him in the Garden of Gethsemane at that moment. And so why would we be reading a book (laughs) at that moment? Not that reading a book is a bad thing, but we don't need to. We have something greater to attend to in that moment. It's a powerful thing, if you think about it. The most beautiful thing. If we, I think if we really grasp what adoration provides us, what it allows us to do, we would have this intense thirst for it. And our experience then also of mass would change radically too. Because the heightened experience of that intimacy with him and adoration leads us into the celebration of the Eucharist more fully and then that deeper celebration of the Eucharist leads us back to you know, the perpetuating of that adoration through Eucharistic adoration. Wow, that was quite a digression. Sorry about that. (laughs) Okay, just one one little more, one section here. Where are we? Again. Again, if a brother asks for a book to read or some other thing to use, and either his request annoys us or our refusal puts him off, then there is no doubt that we are still held bound in the snares of avarice and the love of money. If either a sudden thought or a passage of Holy Scripture conjures up the memory of a woman for us and we feel ourselves somewhat titillated by it, then we should know that the ardor of fornication is not yet extinct in our members. And if our mind is even only very slightly tempted to be lifted up at the comparison of our own strictness and someone else's laxity, then it is certain that we have been corrupted by the foul plague of pride. When, therefore, we perceive the indications of these vices in our heart, we should recognize clearly that it is not the disposition to sin, but its effect that is lacking in us. 
Indeed, if we sometimes get ourselves involved in a human way of life, these passions immediately emerge from the caverns of our thoughts and demonstrate that they were not born when first they erupted, but rather that they appeared then precisely because they had lain hidden for a long time. Thus, even the solitary who strives not to show his purity to human beings, but to manifest it in inviolate before him, from whom no secrets of the heart can be hidden, perceives from telltale indications whether the roots of each vice are implanted in him. So we can't be under any illusion here that the, the eruption of a sin or an eruption of a passion can take place after a long time of negligence of really being attentive to what's going on in our heart that we might, even in subtle ways, expose ourselves to things, allow imagination, fantasy, or, or just you know, pull away from prayer in a subtle way, that, or allow ourselves to have a thought about our brother, a passing thought about our brother without rebuking ourselves, that this can set the stage for a greater form of that passion or a greater fall. So that's why they would always say, tell us, you know, you take every thought captive, not in an obsessive way, but because later on it could emerge into something that's far stronger and much more difficult to remove from the heart. It says, it says in that same earlier section I mentioned about prayer that the mind of its own has absolutely no constancy. So we, we wouldn't be able to somehow think that we're we're, you know, we're all set, you know, the board is waxed, and right. we're on the perfect wave. Right, yes. Yeah, there always has to be humility yeah. at work in the spiritual life. Because the illusion can be so great, uh, we can think that we've reached some level of sanctity, and it can be completely false. And I think that's why God even, you know, lets us experience those forms, we'll often ask that, you know, why, why did that happen? And, you know, some great failure or something that hu humiliates us. And I think there's providence often in that to, you know, protect us from something far greater, that we're, some weakness within us is revealed, even when we thought we saw everything perfectly. Or we worked so hard on something, even of a spiritual nature, and it came to nothing. And again, you know, the reason for that can simply be to humble us. Newman is a really good example of this, that he was given permission by his community, even as provost, we take st a promise of stability. So we're never to live outside of the house, but he was given permission by his community to live outside of the house as provost, as superior, was uh, charged by the bishops to go and start a Catholic college in Ireland. And he spent, I think it was like seven years doing that and guiding his community back in England through writing and traveling back and forth. And it came to nothing. It failed. The pursuit failed. And one might wonder, you know, why something like that would happen? Why would God allow, you know, all this sacrifice and hard work to take place? You know, Newman obviously did it in good faith. And, and obedience, but it still came to nothing, and it must have been a very painful experience for him. But he's also a blessed, and there's another miracle on the way that uh, looks pretty promising, which might lead to you know his canonization. So, <laughs> you know, perhaps that's greater the virtue, the hidden, maybe even the hidden virtue within his heart, is greater than creating a Catholic college in Ireland which eventually did take place, but not through his hands. But didn't that happen with many of the saints? Hmm? Yes. Many of the saints were knocked down many times. Right. Yes, many times. Okay. Yes? Just your, your comments on uh, adoration. It, it almost seems like they're presenting to us the two great, you know, the and the, It almost seems like adoration is, for us, perhaps a third that there's some commonality between adoration and 
aspects of both of these lifestyles that could allow some of this to flow into yeah, I think there's something really providential in the emergence of adoration as it has emerged in our day, that it's existed for centuries, of course. But the, the fact that we have received this call coming out of Rome, you know, there was Cardinal Humes, you know, issued this call to all the bishops throughout the world to establish you know, places of adoration, to have uh, places of perpetual adoration in their diocese, but adoration in all their parishes in some level, and uh, there wasn't a great response to it. But it has emerged slowly, begin to see people drawn more and more to it. And I think there's a reason for it, and I think it's for the, you know, it's to make reparation for this, the sins of the world, the sins of the church, of the clergy, that if adoration is the preeminent form of reparation, that we're consoling Christ and engaging him as if it were in the Garden of Gethsemane, that we're offering the full gift of ourselves in that, in that prayer and, and giving that time, that there's something extremely important for the life of the church and the formation of the minds and the hearts of Christians that are often faced then with a void in regards to spiritual formation you know, uh, whether it's within the parish or, or elsewhere in regards to preaching or formation in the spiritual life, that we're given this gift of adoration to draw people into this intimate relationship where we might even not even fully understand what is taking place. There might just be this simple gaze that begins to develop over time that becomes deeply healing of the person's soul and the healing of one individual Christian strengthens the whole body of the church. And to have one person praying for priests and offering you know, sacrifices as well as that deep prayer for them can help renew the life of the priesthood, which is so essential for the life of the church. So I think God is doing something to renew the church and perhaps the ways that it didn't take place after the council, you know, that he provides, he guides the church and guides the, the members of the church in ways that might be hidden and, but yet bear extraordinary fruit. Don't you think too that there's a direct connection with adoration and vocations? I mean, it just seems to me it just makes perfect sense. You're more likely to answer the call when you know who's calling. Right. And that's the best way to get to yeah. know well, So I hope, I hope it does grow. Yeah, I think that's true with prayer as a whole, but certainly I think where there's this kind of deep, intimate prayer of adoration that's going to be true. And often that is the case where you have parishes where adoration is frequent as well as sacraments made available, confession and things such as that, often you'll see this uptick of vocations. And we've seen it here. You know, one of the reasons that we started Adoration here is a layperson came to us and said, do you want to, oh, uh, I think he had actually gone to a bishop and said, do you want to solve your vocation problems and financial problems? Start Adoration. And, you know, we had heard that, and we, by the grace of God, because of the way things just are here at the Oratory, we're able over time to do that. And we've seen that, not just vocations to the Oratory, but throughout the diocese. But if you look at the pictures of the guys who are studying for the diocese, most of them <laughs> came here for adoration at one point or another. And same thing with women religious, you know, a lot have come through here, and a lot say that, you know, the same thing, adoration is what sort of enlivened their faith and that desire, you know, deepened that desire for a vocation. So, yeah, I see a direct connection.
be in the heart of Christ brings a kind of peace that surpasses understanding as well as anything that the world can give. Okay, why don't we stop there for this evening, we'll pick up next week, which I think is Ash Wednesday. Isn't, yeah. Is everybody good with having yeah. uh, meeting Ash Wednesday? Okay, and then after the group also we'll talk about if anyone wants to go to Father Yvonne's church on Sunday for the Vespers. Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the Lord be with you. And may God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.